Thank you, Minister Ann. Appreciate that. Appreciate your prayers. Most of them aren't working, but. <laughs> Fortunately, I get to be me. <laughs> well, welcome. I, I know I'm not the first to welcome you, but welcome. Today is one of my favorite days of the year. I try to celebrate it every day of the year. Pastor Appreciation Sunday. We, uh, I, I, I genuinely love my pastors. I've known them for the better part of a bunch of years. We'll just say it that way. <laughs> we go back several decades, and uh, I've got some stories I get to tell today. So I, uh, I'm looking forward to that. Um, what does pastor appreciation look like? Well, I'm glad you asked, even though you may not have. So I'm going to start off with the word, and then we're going to work out from there. So if you'll turn with me and to be on screen for you as well, and I apologize, I didn't adjust the slides properly, but that's on me. So we're going to read from Ephesians 4, 7, 11 through 16. It says, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Verse 11, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning craftiness of people in their deceitful scheme, scheming. Verse 15, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is Christ, from him, the whole body, joined and held together at every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Lord, let your word go through today. Let it settle in the hearts of these, your sons and daughters. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to give some quick context on that because it's important to know the who, the what, the where, the why. Because otherwise it's easy to take and twist it for what we want it to do and what we want it to say. But that's not what Scripture is supposed to be done with. We're supposed to wield it in the way that it was given. So I wanted to write this down and just write it out the way that they wrote it. It says, Paul here is finishing in this sentence as prior, telling the believers in Ephesus how to maintain the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, if you read 4, 1 through 5. He says, being completely humble, gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love. So Paul's already spoken to the church at Ephesus on how to maintain the unity of spirit and the bond of peace. And it starts off with humility. It starts off with gentleness. It starts off with love. We can't get to unity in the spirit and the bond of peace until we go through those first. It's a simple map. It's a simple path. But it's a hard one to walk. It's a hard one to follow. So when we say that, maintaining the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, does that mean we need to mimic our pastors? Does it mean we have to talk like them and act like them and think like them and behave like them? No. That's the best part about being in Christ is we get to be different. And our differences, we get to be unified in Christ. And that's what we get to see. And the world looks at us, he goes, how do those people get together? They're not even of the same family. They're not even of the same background, the same culture. But when you walk in this place, when you, when you see us out and about, and if one of you sees one of us in a grocery store, we're hugging on each other. We're not asking what your background is and if I'm allowed to hug you. And this is what we do. This is family to us. You're family to me. I may be the crazy uncle, but you're still my family. <laughs> Take it or leave it. <laughs> but it's in our diversity that we get to be unified. And that's what attracts the world to us. As you've seen over the past few weeks and even last month, Pastor Dee's love of the Jewish culture, but she has a reason for it. We'll get into that as we get through this. She loves the Jewish culture. She wants to understand the celebrations and the feasts because in doing that, she gets to understand Christ all the better. She gets to understand why he was celebrated thousands of years before he ever came. That to me is amazing. People were partying at his birthday long before he was born. They weren't doing that for me. But to do that, we have to understand the languages. 
So Greek is kind of a fun language. It, it, it's, we'll get into it, but it's, it's an interesting language as I'm learning. So I had a few words put up on the, on the screen that I wanted to just talk about real briefly. The first word is agape. Agape can mean a couple of different things, love, esteem, or affection. The next word is chiris. That means grace, favor, or goodwill. The word after that is pomain. It doesn't look like it, but I promise it is. <laughs> that middle letter that looks like a big U with a long leg, that is actually an M. Right. The N that we would call N, that's actually an ADA. It's pronounced E, like an E. And that V at the end that we would consider it to be a V, that's called NU. NU is what we, we pronounce it as N. No, 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 no. So that word looks a little different. And that last word, didaskalos. It's a funny word. Yes, thank you. I have one of those coming in Hebrew too. But it means teacher or instructor. And, and what I want to do is before I get too far, most of the letters in Greek look like many of our letters in English. I think, I, I think when I was first starting this, there's like 18 letters that are similar to the English language out of 24 that are in Greek. So you're really only learning six letters. And most of them you've already seen or know, one of them is pi, or in Greek they call it p. So, so now you only got five more to learn. Well, that's pretty easy. I'm saying this to encourage you. So my title for the sermon today is, what are all these crazy sounding words? But it gets better. So in Hebrew, I, I, was, I was a little more cautious in throwing more Hebrew words up there because that's a little more difficult to read, and, and we're, we'll get into it. So the word I wanted to bring up, and this has got an interesting story behind it that just happened this morning, is the word shalom. It doesn't look like it up there because they don't do anything like we do. It's totally different. They read, we, lead, we read left to right, they read right to left. So that first letter is actually on the right side. It looks like a big W. That's their word. That's their letter called shin. There's another one that has the dot on the opposite side. It looks identical to it. It's called sin. So if you take the time and just learn, there's only 24 of them. Once you get through it, it's actually pretty easy. Most of them look similar to ours. I just want to encourage you in this for a reason. But this word shalom, as you can see on the screen, it means a number of things. Peace, prosperity, success, intactness, whole, sound, in full number, welfare, state of health, friendliness, deliverance, salvation. So this one word that the, that the Hebrews use is so pregnant with so much stuff that when we read it in the Bible, it says, God grants you peace. Crickets. But when the Jews hear it, they hear, may God grant you peace, prosperity, success, intactness, wholeness, sound, in full number, welfare, state of health, friendliness, deliverance, and salvation. Every time they hear that word, that's what they hear. But we hear peace. Not that peace is a bad thing, but these words are so much bigger. Yeah. We just celebrated Rosh Hashanah, and as Pastor D said, it sounds like something you guys say, God bless you too. <laughs> and then Yom Kippur just passed, but Yom Kippur, I would probably ask the waiter not to add that to my food. <laughs> Please hold that back. My wife, however, would be like, no, add extra for that. So it kind of balances out. <laughs> now you may say, I didn't sign up for all of this, but who reads the entire end user language, the EULA, the whole agreement when you sign up for a piece of software, who reads that whole thing? Right. <laughs> None of us. So you did sign up for it, you just didn't read it at the end when you clicked accept. Yeah. It's there. <laughs> so before we get too deep into this, I want to ask, what is the job of a pastor? What's the role of a pastor? Well, first, that word, I had it on screen earlier, poimain is the Greek word for it. Throughout the entire New Testament, wherever they use this word, it's translated shepherd. The only place it's translated pastor is in this verse in Ephesians 4. I haven't found out why. I did some digging this week, and none of the commentaries talked about it. I couldn't figure out when they first started using it, but it was never intended, as best I can tell, to be translated that way in the original text. Right, I did the same thing. But we also see when Jesus is called the good pomain, he's the good shepherd. So as is the tie-in, the pastors are the shepherd of the flock. Now, in this passage of Scripture, we had pastor-teacher. 
And it's about 50-50 in academia. Half think that pastor is teacher and teacher is pastor. Because the way it was written, they used what's called a definitive. And I'll talk about more definitives in a minute. Basically, it's our version of the word the. So instead of saying the pastor and the teacher, like we would say sometimes in English, the, Paul, in this case, only wrote the pastor and teacher. So, and a lot of people speak to that. They say pastors are teachers, teachers are pastors. So that's something that we can tie together. I'm not going to say that that's something that's doctrine, but it's something for you to definitely research on your own. So before we get too deep into all of this, I want to give you all a story about my pastors. So, yeah, oh yeah, oh, it's, oh, it's on. So like I said, I've known them for a little bit. My wife and I have known them for a bit. We first met at Grace Covenant Church, and there's this on what's called Huntmar, Huntmar Place, I think is what it was, right? Huntmar Drive, Huntmar Park, Park Huntmar Park Drive. And so we, we, that was kind of like the beginning of where we all met a long, long time ago. And it was Advent, so Christmas season, about, about now. And uh, Pastor D was in charge of the, um, Jamie, help me, it's arts ministry. Creative arts, thank you. I know there's a word there for it. So she was in charge of the creative arts ministry, so she had an Advent play. So my wife and I and our kids went to the Advent play, and we're sitting there enjoying the play. And all of a sudden, I don't know if you all remember, the, the, the older buildings that had the wood doors in the back that had the metal on them that would latch up and down. And when you opened them, they did nothing but just rattle. <laughs> that was the doors in our building. And so, so we hear this noise, and I'm always one to be like, what's going on back there? So I see, and I look back, and I'm like, okay. And, and all of a sudden, there's this radiant light coming through these doors, this bright, gorgeous light. I'm like, what is that? And all of a sudden, I hear these angels singing in harmony. I'm going, who is that? What's going on? And the next thing I know, I'm floating out of my chair because the, the scent that's coming from the back of the room, and what did I see? Perkins fried turkey. <laughs> if you ain't had one, it would change your life. I was torn. And I'll tell you what, there was, a, there, was, there was about ready to be some folk breaking out in some non-Christian fighting in that room. People, people wanted that turkey, something fierce. And then Pastor D announced to all in the room, knowing full and well that there was a mutiny beginning. She said, for cast members only. No, I did the same thing. I was in tears. But that next year, everybody signed up for the play. <laughs> Except for those who didn't know, they had no idea. So, and to this day, I don't know which one of you brought it in. I, don't, I still don't remember. I just remember that fried turkey and, oh my word. I can still smell it to this day. Can you tell? Oh, it's so good. But on a more serious note about our pastors, I want to give you both sides. The day was a Tuesday. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. It was quiet. The date was September 11th, 2001. And I don't remember how we got to doing this, but that afternoon, it was the morning. So we live in D.C. So Pastor Sean was on Fairfax County Police. The Pentagon was hit. Some of the people he knew was on station down there. And so we lived in this area. And, and so one of the people that we all know, she actually closed the door on the airplane that crashed into the Pentagon. It was just the one that, okay, because there was two that left from there. So she actually closed the door on her friends to the one that crashed into the Pentagon. So this was, this was family to us. We knew someone who was directly affected by this moment. But that day, our pastors decided, we're going to get together. And I don't remember if it was a phone tree or because really texts and cell phones weren't a thing at this point. But we had a prayer meeting that afternoon. And it wasn't that long into the afternoon. Or maybe we just knew. I don't remember, but we all got together that afternoon to pray. And it was a pretty full room. It was probably about as many as are in here right now. And I remember Pastor Sean was wearing, actually, a jacket that looked a lot like the one he has on right now. It was, it was more, I remember to this day. And he was on his face, crying out to God for repentance for what we've done as a nation. That's seared in my brain to this day. I'll never forget that. And not too many years after that, Pastor D took over the prayer team. And... and Family, if I could give you the testimonies of everything that happened because of what came out of that team, 
I'm a product of that team. We saw buildings purchased that we shouldn't have afforded as a, as a, as a people. We saw buildings built. We saw, we saw a municipality bend to the will of God and open a building that we needed open because it was their last day. It was like December 13th. It was a Friday or something like that. And they were going to be closed for the rest of the year. And we needed our certificate of occupation to have our Christmas service in our brand new building. We prayed that into happening. These are the pastors that we serve. But that's not all. They pray for each one of us by name every day. And it's not one of those, God bless them, or in the South here, I think they like to say, what is it? Oh, bless you, darling. <laughs> they don't do that. They pray for us. They prophesy over us. They speak life into our lives. They're effortless. They're, they're, it, they make it look so simple. It's annoying, actually. <laughs> love you guys so we know our pastors like to tell us strange words from ancient tongues but I want to give you an analogy so if I came to you and I said the sky is blue okay you could probably get down with that but what if I came to you and I said today I went outside the sky was blue and the clouds were wisping gently across it while a flock of birds were flying over it and it was as if the wind was using the clouds on the background of the blue canvas to paint the sky into a, into a painting that will never be replicated again in life. Which one sounds better? You could probably get on board with the second one quicker than the first one, right? You're like, oh, what else happened? What was next after that? Well, that's translation. I have a question. I was listening to one of my Greek instructors. He, he said, it was a simple thing. He said, define the word run. Run, what does it mean? Well, it depends. I can run a marathon. I can run a lap. I can run to the store. I can run up my credit. I can run to the kitchen cabinet. Right? I mean, how many ways can I use the word run? That means absolutely nothing what we think it means. So the same is for any language. There is no one-for-one -one translation of anything to any language. In the Greek, there's this definitive called Omicron. It's just the letter O. It looks like an O. And generally speaking, it's translated the. Pretty simple. It's, it's actually a masculine. and It doesn't mean that the verb or the word is masculine. It's just how they do their language. It's a lot of European languages are that way. But it doesn't always mean the. Sometimes it means this one or that one. That's one letter in the entire Greek alphabet. That doesn't include the words. That doesn't include the context of how the words were written. But I don't want to scare anyone away from this. I'm hoping that I am, I am enticing you into it. Because this Bible is so rich with things that we don't know. And it's not that it's some hidden secret. It's just because we don't understand. Right? I mean... Today, our generation said certain things before the generation prior to us. This generation says certain things that we're like, huh? So we have to get on board with them to understand what they're saying so we can talk with them. So I want to speak first and foremost to those of you that, that may be a little further down the road of life than some of us. It's a nice way of saying it. You have a chance to leave a legacy behind. You see these young men and young women in this room. We have a chance to tell them, this is what this means. This is what this looks like. This is what this walk looks like. But it doesn't just mean for them. The next generation sometimes is those who are older than us, but only been saved a short period of time. And they need someone to walk with who may be a day older than them. If you've been born again one day and they just got born again, guess who's older? You. So the more I dig into this, the more I find into this, the better I understand this. Why is that important? There's a couple of reasons why that's important. Sometimes we can get tossed in and about with strange doctrines. And if I don't understand what this Bible really says, I'm going to hear something. I'm going to be like, oh, I think I like that. I want to hold on to that. Right? So we got to be careful. 
It's easy to twist anything. All you need is a little bit of truth, and you can add a lie. And you can make it say what you want it to say. But if I know what the word says, if I know what the writer was trying to imply in this moment, as opposed to me just taking a snippet of this scripture out and saying, oh, I'm going to use that for my own, my own gain. No, that's not what this word is for. This word is for so much more than just our temporal things. This is eternal. The lives of these young men and young women in here are eternal. Your lives are eternal. So I want to encourage you. You don't have to be a Greek scholar. You don't have to be a Hebrew scholar. But find that thing, that passion in the word that drives you. And give it to somebody else. Don't keep it for yourself. They call that the Dead Sea. Deliver it to somebody else, no matter who it is. The second reason, and more importantly, and this is where we're going with our pastors, is our relationship with Christ Jesus. Without that relationship, some of the scariest words, and I'll I'll read those here in a moment, but we need to present ourselves as a good worker approved by God. Here's an interesting sentence as I was studying for this. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy, he said, do not be ashamed of the gospel. And I wanted to read this out exactly how the author wrote this. Here, shame is a result, ultimately at God's judgment, 1 John 2, 28, of a lack of proper training and skill in handling God's message of salvation. Anagli- and, and, yeah, we're going to skip that word because my mouth is dry. <laughs> Analogously, there may be those today who are willing to identify openly with Christ and preach his word, but who, because of inadequate training, fail to handle that word properly and thus ought to be ashamed. Those people need not more encouragement or commitment, but proper training and understanding in communicating the scriptural message. Just as a workman takes pride in a job well done, proper preaching of God's word requires training and skill. This isn't my words. This is the words of an academic. Who, who I got this from one of the commentaries. Galatians 1.9, it says, As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you that you have received, let him be accursed. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5 reads, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine. Oops, too many pages. But for a time they will come in, uh, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn away their ears from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Verse 5, but you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. We've got to know what this word says. There's a, there's a popular YouTube channel I enjoy. It's a Christian channel, and they're, they're really, really good. They even say calling balls and strikes. They never attack the person who may be throwing way, way out of bounds. They attack what he's teaching. There's a difference in that because in this world, we've gotten to the point of thinking that, oh, if I post on social media and all these people like it, I must be right. I think they call that being woke. If I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken, the Bible's woke all by itself. We don't need yeah, to help it. Yeah, right, right, right. But the point of this channel isn't to attack the person. And that's what I respect so much about them. They say, this is not sound doctrine, and this is why. They don't even agree with each other a lot of times in certain things. But they, the way that they discuss it, they discuss it honorably amongst one another without tearing the other person down. And family, we need to get to that place. And when you see our pastors, our pastors, you'll never see them tearing someone down to be like, no, this isn't, this isn't what it says. This is what it says. And they'll gently guide you down that path. So pastors are considered modern shepherds, right? In the West, the sheep are driven. <laughs> Not like that. No. So in the West, we use dogs and horses and we chase the sheep. But that's not how it was in the Middle East. That's not how it was in Jesus' time. What they did was they led their sheep. 
The sheep knew the voice of their shepherd and they followed him. That's more of what it looks like. He doesn't have to wonder where they're at. He just walks and they will follow him. There's a thing that they called sheepfolds in the Middle East. And they're at various places throughout the desert. And all they are is they're just these four walls with a small door. I think when it's a couple slides down. Yeah. Some of them look like this. Some of them have a tent in them, depending on how popular it is. And what would happen is in the evening, they would bring their sheep in. But it was never always just one flock. Sometimes it was multiple flocks with multiple shepherds that would mix in this sheepfold. And you see that door right there? I think, Gwen, there's another shot of the door. That's a little bit, yeah. That door, what would happen is the shepherds would take turns sleeping in that doorway. But if we don't know that, we don't understand that Jesus is the good shepherd and he protects us. And the reason they slept in that was they kept predators out and they kept sheep in. Now, what's the question everyone's asking? Well, if you've got three or four flocks in there, right? Who, what's going on? How did these sheep just know? Well, the shepherds would start talking. And the sheep would know the voice of their shepherd. Wow. And they would follow their shepherd. Come on, Brian. And another they would not follow. Ooh. Now, all of a sudden, the scripture begins to open up, doesn't it? Yeah. But what the shepherds would do is they would take these sheep and they would take an anointing oil. And this anointing oil, they would put on them to help keep the bugs off. And while they're doing that, they're singing over their sheep. Oh, wait, doesn't it say that in the Bible that Jesus sings over us? And they would anoint them with oil. And they would, if there was bugs they'd have to pick off, they'd pick them off. But they're constantly talking to these sheep. And these sheep would know the voice of their shepherd. So you can mix flocks all day long. You didn't have to mark them or paint them or anything crazy. You just start talking and your sheep would come. But if we don't know this, we miss out on so much rich text in this Bible. We miss out on what these pastors do for us. How do the pastors play a role in this? This is where it gets fun. Our pastors know the voice of our Savior. And they hear him. But see, this is where it gets better. Our pastors have a pastor that they follow. Let's use the word in the original Greek. Well, translate it. Our shepherds have a shepherd they follow. They have a shepherd who they follow, and they have a shepherd who they follow, all of which follow the good shepherd. That's not to say that they're not following the good shepherd also. These other shepherds are in place to say, no, 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 I think we're doing it wrong. Or nope, you're doing it right here. So when we follow our pastors, we have to understand what, what's the purpose of our pastors. And now for a word from your sponsor. <laughs> Miss Gina's paid for this time slot, so I have to fill it in. Lead well, 215, leadership 215. Please sign up for it. Now, the reason why we have these things, leadership 215, the purple book, the one-to-one -one book, is because we want to carry you and get you into a place where you can do things like this. To understand what is apologetic, systematic theology, homiletics. All these things matter. Because we can't rely on what the, word the world tells us what the word has to say. We have to know for ourselves. And that's why we want to give you all these things to equip you. So tonight at 6 o'clock, Pastor Corey will be on the Zoom call. If you want to come see him, please see Ms. Gina or myself afterwards. Or email lead, leadwell at risecc.org. And that ends the, your, your paid time, Miss Gina. <laughs> so I want to equate it to something to help out on, a, on imagery. Think about a treasure map. And, and you look on this treasure map, and in this treasure map, it's got the X, like every other treasure map always does. But in this treasure map <clears throat> is everything you ever needed for life and godliness, health, strength, peace, love, no lack. In fact, if you brought everybody with you, there would still be no lack. There would still be more than enough. But what if you didn't know how to read that treasure map? What if you knew that those that were left behind 
were going to be left behind in such an incredible amount of pain and agony because they couldn't get to the other side. That's why we have to learn how to read this treasure map. Obviously, the treasure map is the Bible, and the X is the cross of Christ that our pastors are constantly walking toward. You've heard them say, the first one to the cross wins. May that be the same for us. I heard another Bible teacher say it this way. He's a Hebrew. He's one of my Hebrew teachers. He said that when we read the Bible translated for us, we read it through a veil because someone else's worldview is translating it for me. So I have to rely on their worldview and entrust that their worldview matches my worldview, which it never will. doesn't matter. My sister and I, we grew up in the same house. Everything was identical, except for our, obviously our age. But our worldviews are completely different. And that's not for any other thing. That's because I viewed life through these sets of eyes. She viewed life through her sets of eyes. So I have to rely on somebody else's worldview to tell me what this word says. I don't want that. I want to know what this thing says. So one of the things I want to talk on very briefly, because this could be a series all in and of itself. I wasn't going to do this until the Holy Spirit sort of knocked me off my heels. And my wife predicted this like on a Wednesday. She said, you're going to change your sermon. And he didn't do it till this morning. So thank you, dear, for giving me a heads up. First Timothy 2.12 reads, and I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but be in silence. Now, as we've talked about here, we've used this doctrine to hold women back because we think it says one thing and it doesn't, not even close. When you get into the original Greek, and I'm sorry if I'm getting a little fired up because this gets me mad when the daughters of God are treated so poorly. This, this in the original Greek is specifically talking about one person in a particular location at a particular time. And the verb that's used that he says, I do not permit, is what we call present active indicative. What that means is it's almost like me coming to you saying, I don't want to drink of water. Does that mean I don't want to drink of water for the rest of my life? And that anyone who comes after me shouldn't have a drink of water? I just don't want it for that moment because I'm not that thirsty or I'm drinking something else, or whatever the case may be. But we've turned this into a theological doctrine, and we've used it as a battering club against the daughters of God. How dare us? I stand up here proudly saying I follow my lead pastors, and one of them is a female. I have no problem with that. And those who want to discuss, please come see me. I am more than happy to go into this. I am very, very passionate about it. Because what did it say in Ephesians? Who gave apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists? Who? And who's he? He's the everything. He's the sovereign. If he gave it, then who am I to question it? Let's just be real. If I'm stepping on toes, I'm not apologetic. I'm really not. Because this is something that I remember before we came down here, Pastor D and I were on a phone call together, and the Spirit of God hit me so hard, I had to pull my truck over because I couldn't see. I was weeping so heavily. And you can ask her. She was on the call listening. So one of the things, I'm two minutes over, and I apologize. I'll get through this last bit as quick as I can. I want to first and foremost, as a man in the church, repent to all you women out there. And apologize for how we've treated you, for how we've pushed you down, how we've kicked you. The words that we've said that are harsh and cutting. I want to represent, hopefully, the men that have done that in your lives and ask for your forgiveness. I stand and I've stood before Almighty God asking for forgiveness for the way the church has treated you. The way that we as men have used you as women for our own desires and our own goods. That's not the heart of our God. It never has been. And I am so sorry for that. So I asked a question earlier, what is the job of a pastor? I had to write this note out so I could remember it. Either to straighten us before we go astray and to don't do that. Even though I get a lot of no's, (laughs) she knows. I'm still waiting for the yes. Pastor Sean's got a big grin on his face for those you can't see. (laughs) 
The job of the pastor is to shepherd us, to prepare the saints for the work of service, for the building of the body of Christ, to identify the path to that treasure, which in case you couldn't guess it, is Jesus himself. The purpose of the pastor is to shepherd and lead the sheep of the representatives around him. One of the scariest verses in Scripture is Matthew 7, 21 and 23. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, for you who practice lawlessness. That will be a sad moment for some people. The job of our pastor is to lead us and guide us into relationship with Christ Jesus. That's why she comes up here and says these strange words. Because she doesn't want it to be just her on that day when Jesus says, I know you, enter into my rest. She wants it to be all of us. He wants it to be all of us. Today is a pastor appreciation, and most people usually preach out of 1 Timothy, and I don't want to skip over that. It's talking about double honor. 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18 reads, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and in doctrine. For the scripture says you should not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of their wages. So in this verse of scripture, they're talking about two things, double honor. Well, what's the first one? Well, the first one is following them in obedience. I'm not saying that they're going to be 100% right 100% of the time, and they know that, and they're okay with that. But if we're going to go to them and say, hey, I think this is a little bit different, don't just go to them with a club and be like, no, no, you're wrong, you're wrong. Hey, let's discuss this. What, what were you saying when you said this? I want to understand. We're here for one another. We're not here to attack one another. And the second reason is he talks about material, to be able to help them in their time of need to be able to cover them. And many of you have given. We're so grateful for giving to our pastors. So, Ron, if you'll please come up. Deb, if you please come up. We have a gift to present to our pastors. And as they're coming up, some of you received some, some paper and a pen. And the reason for that is if you didn't have a chance to fill it out, the question I've asked the hospitality team to pass on as you fill out these papers is, how have our pastors brought you closer to Jesus? Because that's all that's really eternal. The rest of this is immaterial. That is eternal. So, Pastors Perkins, if you could please come up. And while they're coming up, while they're coming up, I'm going to read a few words that I've collected over the, over the last few weeks. The Perkins have taught me not only how to live in a biological relationship, but also in spiritual relationship as brother and sister in Christ, fulfilling the purposes of we have been called to do. That was Minister Craig Stevens. Leon and Esther Smalls wrote this. The Apostle Paul spoke to the people of Corinth in 1 Corinthians 11.1 1, and said to them, For my, follow my example as I follow Christ. That was a great representation of what it meant to get closer to Christ. As we reflect on our Christian walk, we relate two more great examples. Pastor Nell and Pastor Sean, they are our present day examples to emulate as followers of Christ. Amina Murray show. She's in the UK and she'll be getting to the States hopefully sooner rather than later. She wrote, they have helped us by checking in with us even though we're halfway across the world sharing amazing words of wisdom and godly sound advice. Minister Amanda Noble wrote this, Sean, Pastor Sean and Pastor D truly live their faith. They lead by example, serve by example, love others by example. They have encouraged me, challenged me, and believed in me, which has strengthened my desire to draw closer to God. Minister Joshua Johnson wrote this. I have two more and I'll be done. <laughs> Pastor Sean and Pastor Donnell have always been a source of godly guidance and mentorship for me. Not only by their words, but by, not just by their words, but by their example. They live what they preach and never cease to show what it looks like to serve God and to love and honor your family. As I've gotten to do life with them, they have challenged me in positive ways to continue to pursue first God first in everything, I, as I do as a husband, as a father, and now as a minister. I thank God for their leadership, counsel, and love over myself, my family, and our church. And the last one is you'll get to know him, and he's a son of the house, Pastor A.J. and Angel Mosley. The Perkins showed me what a pastor is during a time of incredible difficulty. In the midst of my own failures, they encouraged me that my mistakes are not where I end. 
They showed me that a pastor is not someone you run from with a problem, but someone you run to with a problem. They have shepherded me back to a place of health by tending to the wounds of my past with care and correction. They've never been ashamed of or looked down on me. They've pushed me to hear God and believe him at his word. My wife and I are first fruits of their apostolic gift to pastor other pastors. We are better because they have chosen to love us. Amen. Family, if you please rise. Let's give Jesus and our pastors a handful of gratitude. Well, I have the honor to present our love gift to you all. Uh, I'm representing many, many people, um, seen and unseen in this room and people online. Uh, you are great leaders. You are great pastors. You didn't have to, you hit the ground running. You didn't have to learn how to pastor when you came here. You came prepared. Yeah. And we, we thank you for that. We thank you for your diligence and being ready, answering God's call, and your fruits are seen and will continue to be seen. We love you all. We love you what you do and how you do it, and you know how to do relationships. We love you for that. God bless you all, and I'm not going to try to uh, do anything on top, top of what Pastor Brian just said on what those words are. All I can say is ditto to all of you. <laughs> God bless you, my brother. Thank you. Pastor Sean and Pastor Janelle, thank you so much for the excellent way in which you lead us, you shepherd us, you train us, you teach us, and when we need it, you correct us. And thank you for the phenomenal example that you set for us. And you just don't say it, but you show us. So we thank you so much. So on behalf of Rise Community Church, we want to present you with this gift. And we ask that you open it now so that everyone can see it. So this is a book <laughs> of all of the prophetic words that has been spoken over you and Pastor Sean and Rise from the time that Rise Community Church has started yeah. until now. Yes. Um, wow. So, yes. Speechless is deep. Because <laughs> I always got something to say. No comment. <laughs> you, you talk to uh, well, thank you guys. How kind. Y'all have a seat for a moment. Oh, my God. We, uh, we won't keep you, but we do want to take a moment yeah, to say you. thank you. You know, when, when God speaks and he says, come and go a place, and I'm going to do a great thing with you. As a fatherless boy, the youngest of five, born in the ghetto of Chicago and raised in the inner city outside Newark, New Jersey, who would have thought that God can take the foolish things of this world to confound those who are wise? Yeah. And that he would give me the wife that I have and he would give me the life that I enjoy. And then he says, now serve me. And I'll be your God and you'll be my son. So the father I always longed for, he promised that he would be and he was. Mm -hmm. And so you go through this life and you want to be obedient. And then you go, what's next? And he says, I want you to pick up everything. I want you to sell your home and give away your belongings and pick up your people and go to Horry County. They don't even know how to pronounce an H. <laughs> Why? Why? And so we come, and we, we're obedient, and then a people will decide, we love you enough that we'll go with you, and we'll build this thing, and we'll do this thing together, and then we have this kind of moment where we 
look out into this audience and we see fantastic, amazing people of God. Our brothers, our sisters, who we get an opportunity to love and to have love us. You see, if our failure to obey God would have meant that we would have never looked in your eyes, that we would have never hugged you, we would have never eaten with you, we would have never enjoyed fellowship with you because we chose not to. It wasn't the will of God. But the will of God is for us to be with you, and for that we're grateful yeah. that you'll come and that you'll call us pastor. And remember this moment. Because when God multiplies, we won't forget that you matter to God, that people matter to God. Right. And it's not just about having a big church, but it's about impacting lives for the kingdom. We're grateful to be able to shepherd you in that. Thank you for your demonstrated love. Yeah. We're grateful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, just ditto what he said. I mean, um, to, to really walk in faith, and all of you know what that feels like, because God will tell you to do something, and it just looks so opposite. And I can remember, you know, doing a, a, a diverse and multicultural church in the DMV, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. That wasn't such a hard stretch for us, but for me personally, coming here was a hard stretch. And I said, Lord, I'll do what you want me to do, but I don't know about this multicultural church down south. You know, I'm, I'm in, God. But, and just to see what God is doing and the caliber of people that he's drawn. And he keeps telling me, and I'm not even through yet. And so I just want to thank you all for hearing the voice of God because it never makes sense. Am I the only one when God says something? It just does not make sense. And he said, that's why you need faith. Just do what I say do. And it's always been my husband and I's dream because our pastor has been so awesome in our lives. He's trained us. He's grown us up. We are his son and daughters and not just leaders in his church. And he grew up similar to how I grew up. And to think that God's kingdom could really thrive here is a good ideal in your head. But when you try to do it, all of you know the, odd, the, the ins and outs of diversity. But Sean and I have seen it, and we know it can be done. Difficult? Yes. Impossible? No. Because God will draw people that have his heart. And I just want to thank you for having his heart. Because as my husband said, all of you were who God knew would come. We didn't see you yet. So we had to take a leap by faith. And as he said, sell everything and move. We felt like Abraham and Sarah, and I felt as old as Sarah. Like, God, I don't need a baby now. I'm good. <laughs> you know, I'm good, God. But he knows best. And I'm just, I'm blown away at what he's already done and the people that he's bought and the people that he would continue. So I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you for hearing and knowing the heart of God and doing it. And um, I, I specifically want to thank um, James and Grace because they... <laughs> God is so good. Uh, Grace has a message on the power of connection. And when we first came to uh, Asher, my husband did, just to see if they would rent a space for our launch service. And um, when my husband met them, he was like, you got to meet them. You need to come. <laughs> so I rushed to the school and got the kids, came back. But just their generosity, their love for God, their faith, because they didn't know us. We knew somebody mutual. Um, how many of y'all know Sinbad, um, the comedian? Well, he's my pastor, our pastor's brother-in-law. But what I didn't know is he was a cl he's a close friend to James. And so while we're in the theater, Sean sees the picture of Sinbad, says, you know Sinbad? Long story short, James, behind, <laughs> we didn't even know he was reaching out to Sinbad while we were still in the theater. You know, he going to check it out, make sure we are who we say we are. <laughs> And thank God Sinbad texted him immediately. And he said, yeah, I know the Perkins. They're good people. Do you know that's all it took for them to let us stay here? God is good. God, we had no clue where we were going to meet. But we just knew God sent us here. So James and Grace, thank you for knowing God, hearing God, supporting us the way you do. 
we, we are just so grateful for you. Words couldn't even describe what they have done for us. And so we're grateful. And we, all, we know all of it is God's provision. And so I just want to tell each and every one of you, put your seatbelts on. Because the words that God has been giving us have been amazing. And he said he built the foundation. Now he's getting ready to send fruit that remains. And, you know, foundations are strong. Foundations are necessary. So all of you in this room are foundations to what God wants to do. And the, the pictures and the visions he's given us of how large this church is going to be, not that I don't want it to be large, but I just love this group right here. You know, I just love the closeness and the knitness, and uh, prayerfully we can always keep that because we're family. We believe that. And so we pray that we have served you uh, well. We're going to get better in serving because we're growing in God too. But we are grateful for each and every one of you, especially our team. Thank you, team. Y'all are amazing. You all moved with us, sold houses, um, left jobs. One thing to sell your house, another thing to leave your job. <laughs> You know, but all of us knew if God is sending us, he's going to bless us with new jobs and new houses. And that's what he's done. So thank you for your faith in us as we keep our faith in God. And as Paul said in closing, follow us as we follow Christ. Amen. Thank you so much.